Previously on Justified by Jury. Because it's such a reality check because it's only two of us up here. And she's so missed. But we want to thank everybody for your support. And being there for us, we really thank you. We love you guys and we know that Lisa's smiling. And we just hope that she's proud of us right now. Thank you. From the time Brittany Murphy was little, she had big dreams of being a star. Whether it was in local plays, on Broadway, in the movies, in the studio, or just in the comfort of close friends, she had a knack for being a full-on entertainer and would be blessed to achieve heights that most only dream of. However, as she continued to rise, strict demands and extreme pressure to adhere to the beauty and behavioral standards at the time took away the joy in her passion and left her with an empty void that the wrong people would fill with poison, which ultimately led to her demise. You're watching Justified by Jury, and in chapter nine of the Unfortunate Demise series, we will detail Britney's early years, her rise to fame, her falling in and out of love before ending up in the wrong hands, her strange death, and the never ending series of unfortunate events that go on to this very day. Let's get started. Born in Atlanta on November 10th, 1977, just a day shy of good luck, her early years were less than ideal. Her Italian father, Angelo Bertolotti, was a World War II vet and a mortician, but he also ran with the mob in upstate New York and racked up several convictions over the years, serving time for many of his crimes. Her mother, Sharon Murphy, split from him when Brittany was two, and Brittany would be forced to leave her half-siblings and move to Edison, New Jersey to be raised solely with her mother. Growing up, times were tough as Sharon struggled financially, and the two would eat spaghetti night after night because that was all they could afford. Yet and still, Brittany would express her talents as a toddler by putting on shows for her mother and family friends. She would take up dance lessons, and by the time she was nine, she was acting in the regional theater production of the musical Really Rosie. And right off the bat, her acting coaches noticed her spark and saw her zest for the arts at such a young age. She truly stood out and had all of her plans mapped out. Broadway or Hollywood. <laughs> First I wanted to go to Broadway, then Hollywood. And then I just wanted to do a bunch of things. Going into entertainment using her mother's last name, she would fly to New York and film several commercials over the years for brands like Twix, Honey Bunches of Oats, and 90210's doll collections. But beyond having a pretty face, People could tell that she had the bubbly girl next door personality that would make great for television. Sound like a good personality. So, Brittany, where are you from? Edison. Edison? Yes. And you come to the fair every year? Mm -hmm. Yes? Yes. You want to say hello? Anything's out there? Is there anything you want to say to your mom or anything out there? Hi, Mom. Hi. <laughs> Tell you what, I'm going to give you a shot and you get to interview. How okay. about you interview these people over here? Okay, sure. Hi. Do you like the fair here today? Yeah. What's your name? Caritza. Where are you from? Edison. Edison. Oh my goodness. How old are you? Eleven. Why are you here at the fair today? Because it's fun. Give us your name and what school do you go to? <laughs> Hi, my name is Brittany Murphy and I go to Herbert Hoover Middle School. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Her very first role in a TV show was ironically as a kid sister in Murphy Brown, but it was uncredited. So in order to take this acting thing a bit more seriously, her mother realized the amount of devotion it would take from both of them, so she would quit her job and move to LA to support her daughter's dreams 100%. And just a week later, Brittany would land the role of Brenda Drexel, the teacher's daughter, on the 1991 Fox sitcom Drexel's Class, which would be short-lived. But Brittany didn't sweat it. She would get fast to work building her resume by appearing in one episode increments of several TV shows like Parker Lewis Can't Lose, Kids Incorporated, Blossom, and Frasier before appearing in her first film called Family Prayers. And though her role was very small, with her character not uttering a single word, Brittany was just excited to be on a journey. She would land her second TV show called Almost Home playing Molly Morgan, a main character, but the series only lasted for one season. Around this time, Britney started exploring other talents. She would join a music group with friends from Kids Incorporated called Blessed With Soul, and they would cover popular songs by groups like Kid In Play and High Five. 
However, this too would be short-lived. Britney would snag recurring roles in shows like Sister Sister and Party of Five before she would finally get her big break as Ty in the 1995 cult classic, Clueless. Her character is a transfer student who instantly stands out due to her differences in appearance and attitude towards the other students. Her character is given a full makeover to make her appear more attractive and popular. After that fails, it's realized that Ty's personal substance is what's important and wins people over, rather than looks or popularity, which would prove to be prophetic for Britney in real life. And then there was her most viral quote. You're a virgin who can't drive. Though the main character, Cher's image is what Hollywood idolized, it was Ty's fun, goofy, yet cutesy persona that captivated many audiences and what many teen girls and young women could relate to. She would be featured in the Clueless spinoff series briefly, along with appearances on Boy Meets World and Sequest 2032. Her voice being equally captivating and full of character, she provided the voice of Luann Platter on the animated series King of the Hill, which spanned her entire career, appearing in 254 episodes total. She lightens up all the dark corners of my head. She like comes from the, the, the brightest, most corner of my brain. She's very happy and joyous and very hysterical. Look, Aunt Peggy, I got my practice head. It's got real hair and everything. Well, Luann, it's a very nice head. Don't touch it! She went on Broadway for A View from the Bridge in 1998. But Hollywood would come calling for her once again, this time to film thrillers and eventually horror films, as many producers and directors felt like she was perfect to play opposite the dark, twisted, and vile characters as she was able to channel and feed off of the dark energy that came with stories like Girl Interrupted, The Devil's Arithmetic, and Cherry Falls. However, though she had good looks, Hollywood had a certain standard of beauty at that time, in which the majority of lead roles for women that involved being sexy were catered to skinny blondes. And though there was nothing wrong with Britney's looks, or her weight for that matter, her phenotype wasn't associated with what was considered glamorous or cream of the crop and she kept being typecasted into these battered scorned woman roles or the decent looking best friend roles. And at one point, a very important figure in Hollywood had told her that she was huggable but not fuckable. A clear cut example being her biggest role at that point, which was on Clueless, where for years, many dim wits associated her as being the fat and mildly attractive girl while comparing her to her beauteous co-stars from the movie Stacey Dash and Alicia Silverstone. But constantly trying to evolve and work her way to the top, she would internalize these statements as her not being alluring enough, and she would slim down significantly, only to add on pounds of makeup. She would dye her hair blonde, get extensions, and had a full makeover to appeal to wider audiences. Though the drastic changes in her looks were a shocker, she was still being typecasted as the ditzy, mentally unstable damsel in distress in thriller roles like in Don't Say a Word, and again, the fun-loving best friend in Riding in Cars with Boys, which was honestly one of the most melancholy films ever produced. The bleak reality was so authentic and the acting was so phenomenal. So if you want to be upset and frustrated with absolutely no resolve, definitely watch this movie. But it would be her role in Eminem's 8 Mile that would thrust her back into the limelight on a macro level, and her character being unlike any other she had portrayed was fierce, sexy, a diva playing by her own rules, but Britney's girl next door charm gave the character her vulnerability as well. Finally, she was able to be seen in her glamour and for her true potential. Her and Eminem's flaming connection on the screen was said to have been very much present off the screen. What now is there, was there, was there romance here, actual, not big screen romance, but you, you know what I'm saying? Why Dave, I'd never kiss and tell. Well, no, okay, but uh, I'm talking about off the silver screen. Yep. Yeah, what? Yeah, 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 sure. Really? <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Well, and and okay. how, did, how, how did that go? Uh, well, it went. It, it came and went. <laughs> in any case, Eminem was a rapper in his prime years, and you know how that go. Ain't no settling down at that point in most cases. But the best in Britney's career and in her love life was yet to come, as her appearance in 8 Mile opened up the doors for her to be cast as the leading lady in several films like Little Black Book, Uptown Girls as a nanny to Dakota Fanning's character, and Just Married with Ashton Kutcher, 
and the chemistry that they had together on and off the screen was that carve your initials into a tree type of love. So simple, goofy, yet full of life, but not without its rainy days. It did help that Britney had now achieved the skinny blonde look that Ashton himself was a particular fan of. Before Britney, Ashton himself had dated two skinny blondes, both named Ashley. But one of the girls, Ashley Ellerin, he didn't get to date for very long, as she would be brutally murdered while waiting on Ashton to pick her up to take her to a Grammy's after party in February of 2001. The story goes that Ashton was going to take her to dinner and take her for drinks before the party, but got caught up watching the Grammys at a friend's house. He called her around 8.25 to let her know that he'd be running late. She told him that she had just gotten out of the shower and had to dry her hair. He said bet, but wouldn't show up till around 10.45 p.m. He knocked and tried to open the door, but there was no answer. The lights were on and her car was in the driveway, but she wasn't answering her phone. Figuring that she was angry at him for being so late, he would leave. But what actually had happened was that a creepy acquaintance of hers named Mike Gertrulo had been stalking and trying to get at her. And even though she would let him stay if ever he showed up unannounced to her house parties, she let him know that she wasn't interested. However, neither her nor her roommates knew that he was actually a serial killer who got gratification from stabbing young women. And authorities believe that when he found out that Ashley was going out with Ashton Kutcher, he knew he couldn't compete. And so he broke off into her apartment as she was getting ready for her date and viciously attacked her before fleeing the scene and evading police for nearly 20 years. Ashton would later learn that the reason that Ashley didn't answer the door that night that he knocked is because she lay dead on the bathroom floor with over 47 stab wounds and that this likely wouldn't have happened had he been on time. So throughout his next set of relationships, he took things slow and easy, not ever getting too serious. And for a long time, him and Brittany hadn't put labels on anything. They just enjoyed each other's company and started hanging out more and more after filming Just Married. And before they even knew it, they were together 10 months after the movie was released. And many close friends of hers said that the pair were inseparable and it was the first time that she was ever truly in love and felt it reciprocated. However, the same industry that gave her these great highs seemingly tried to tear her down. Tabloids would scrutinize Britney and Ashton for choosing her and even interviewers would grill him about their relationship. Is Brittany Murphy. Which is your new girlfriend. Yes. She got to be big from Clueless, but can you believe she was the ugly chick in Clueless? I mean, it, that, I mean she was a fat, ugly, ugly chick. Ugly. She yeah. tried to transform yeah. herself. <laughs> what are you talking about? I don't mean to be hard on your girlfriend, but she seems like she's been around the block a couple of times. Oh. No, you know what? Like, I think she's had like three boyfriends. Oh, really? It just so you better wear a condom. Yeah. She's been with Eminem. Yeah. 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 He's been around the block. Yeah. I'm saying, who knows what he's been up to. One thing the media stayed fixated on was her looks, and they were now claiming that she had become too thin too quick, and started spreading rumors about the possible use of substances. <laughs> Go figure. And they would use some of her quirky misunderstood mishaps as leverage for this narrative. Erica, <laughs> uh, just one moment please. For crying out stinking loud, please tell me when you're going to drop it. Okay, and the winner is... Though Britney has addressed the rumors many a time, saying that she couldn't take certain substances even if she wanted to because she had had a heart condition since she was a little girl, the media still wasn't buying it, and endless news articles continued to taunt her for many years, which affected her overall self-esteem. She said she read every comment about her, whether negative or positive, and just imagine experiencing that on such a major level, it seems quite daunting, especially with the negative headlines being out there for the whole world to see as well as her relationship with Ashton coming to an end in front of everyone after less than a year together. Still, Britney had her work. Although the negative press did slow down some of the callbacks for many of the leading lady roles, she would still snag a few flicks like Never Was, The Groomsman, and Love and Other Disasters in leading roles. Now, one thing that kept popping up but kept being overlooked for Britney was her singing talents. All throughout her film career, she had moments where she showcased her ability to hold a tune. Rolling with the homies. Yeah, let's do it. She had even won the role of Janis Joplin in a biopic, which would have been huge. But like many other women who have landed the role of Janis over the years, productions of a Janis Joplin biopic are always canceled before they can get off the ground. But Britney was determined to sing. And in 2006, she would collaborate with British producer Paul Oakenfold 
for the track Fast or Kill Pussycat, which became a worldwide success, peaking at number one on Billboard's Hot Dance Club Play chart and number two on both the Hot Dance Airplay and UK Dance charts. It also reached the top 10 in Scotland and Australia. The music video received heavy airplay on many music channels worldwide, and if any of y'all purchased the Microsoft Zoom Media Player at the time, there was a chance that your device came with this music video already preloaded onto it as part of Microsoft's marketing strategy. This song would also appear in TV shows like The O.C., Alias, Studio 60 on the Sunset Strip, and Revenge, which is one of my favorite TV series. Y'all got to get into that if y'all haven't. Now, Britney would also get her chance to merge film and music in a big way when she landed the role as Gloria in the musical comedy Happy Feet, singing covers of Boogie Wonderland and Somebody to Love. She would also appear on the film soundtrack, which featured artists like Prince, who won a Golden Globe Award for his contributions. Just thought I'd throw that in there. Patti LaBelle, Fantasia, and even Robin Williams, who voiced two of the penguins in the film. The movie was her biggest success in animation for a film, but still there was something missing from Britney's life, and that was true, long-lasting romance. You see, above everything else, she had the longing desire to be married. By now, she had been engaged twice, and both of the engagements were called off, and her heart was lonely and vulnerable. As a matter of fact, both her and her mom felt like it was just them two wandering through life together, not aimlessly, but without the presence of a strong, firm male figure constant in their lives. That is, until they would fall into the hands of Simon Monjack, an English man claiming to be a supreme film producer. And although he had screenwriting credits to his name, his few pieces of work were deemed terrible, and those that knew him dubbed him Conjack, as he had a way of finessing people out of their money and abandoning ship before he could be caught. In 2005, Warrants had been issued for him in Virginia on charges of credit card fraud. The following year, a bank had successfully sued him for 470 k after he had been evicted from four homes, and by February of 2007, he had spent a week in jail and was facing deportation after his visa to the United States had expired. Yet he somehow conned his way to Hollywood, and while it's not known just when he met Britney, his smooth, charming nature had allured her enough for him to marry her privately in her home with just her mother and a few people present, which concerned many of Britney's close friends as they weren't invited. And once tabloids got a hold of the story and took one good look at the odd pairing of the newlywed couple, they went digging and had a field day with the media over Monjack's past. When pressed about him getting married simply to avoid deportation, Britney claimed it simply wasn't true. Instead, she stated that Monjack had actually been kidnapped and that she had to pay a ransom for him to be freed. Now, Monjack being married to Britney alerted him to people who had been looking for him to pay off his multitude of debts that he accrued over the years. He would take over Britney and her mother's lives in every way possible, but kept a charming nature about himself to make it appear as though he was doing this for their own good. And having a strong male presence that seemed genuine around them, they would submit to him. He had security cameras set up all around and throughout the house that they all lived in because he also feared that the government was watching him and the family. He couldn't and wouldn't put anything past anyone, so he had also went on ahead and fired Britney's entire management team and took full control of all finances and assets, the home, the cars, devices, everything. And as her friends became more persistent for her to leave him, her and her mother refused to listen. And the fact that others were questioning his intentions caused him to change Britney's phone and contact info. And now only he would have access to her phone and email. So anytime anyone wanted to reach Britney or her mother, they had to go through him. They themselves didn't even have access to their own devices anymore. And when Simon let up long enough for Britney to film her movies, he had gotten more persistent on control. He became her makeup stylist and he wasn't doing such a hot job at it, and he had strict rules for her. 
as for every extended break she had to go sit with him in the car or in the trailer depending on the budget of the film. She wasn't allowed to do any super intimate scenes with her male co-stars and was strongly discouraged from speaking to them on set once the camera stopped rolling. Simon would also criticize her weight and kept her doped up on different prescription medications so she grew incredibly thin and would show up to set slurring her words and forgetting her lines. Things had gotten so bad that film directors from 2008's The Ramen Girl and 2009's Across the Hall would clash with Simon over his dominating presence because as they put it, if they had any issues with Britney, they were again encouraged to take them up with Simon. They would basically have to threaten to remove her from the set in order for him and her to get their act together. Even though they kept her on board, other film productions did not. She would be dropped from appearing in Happy Feet 2, allegedly over substance abuse allegations. Her character was written out of The Expendables entirely and Disney had dropped her from the 2008 Tinkerbell film. And by the fall of 2009, during the filming of what would be her last movie, called Something Wicked, a source who was on set said that Britney was barely there and would go in and out of consciousness in the middle of takes. By November of 2009, herself, her mother, and Simon would all fly out to Puerto Rico to film another movie, The Caller. But after similar issues arose, and Simon reportedly having verbal altercations with cast members and physical altercations with locals, it was determined that Britney and her team were better off omitted from the project, and she would be fired on day two of filming. Now, while in Puerto Rico, all three members would become very sick, and on the flight back home, Simon would suffer a mild heart attack and Brittany attempted to administer CPR on the plane and said that he was simply just having an asthma attack. When they landed, he was dazed and confused, with EMT taking him to the hospital against Brittany's wishes. It is believed that due to all of the negative press that they had been receiving, neither her, her mother, or Simon wanted to go to the hospital for any treatments as they didn't want tabloids running even more stories of them. Simon had suffered seizures often and her mother Sharon is a breast cancer survivor who was suffering debilitating neuropathy constantly and Brittany herself was anemic with a heart murmur and had suffered chronic pain in her jaw stemming from a horrific car accident that she suffered in 1995 immediately following her breakout role in Clueless. So though the family tried to avoid being seen at the doctors, they also had a mountain of different prescription medications in excess of 90 different bottles with different aliases to keep themselves doped up and away from the pain. Though still sick, she would make her last public appearances in early 2009. And that ambience of course fed yeah. into a film such as this. Um, I'm sorry, you were asking me about June. Yeah, why do you think she ultimately cheated? Um, I, I, I don't know June's actual reasons for cheating. I, I'm very different from June. Yeah. <laughs> very, very different. And really quick, last question. Is it easier, do you find it easier to film comedies or thrillers? What comes more naturally to you? Oh Lord, you know it, for me, I, I've had the good fortune of being able to uh, play characters that are stuck in the middle of comedic situations, comedic stories, ridiculous, or, or, or tragic, and um, I, I, it all has to do with the story and the director, and that, that, that's really where the decisions are, are made on my behalf. Gorgeous. Thank you, you so are. much. I appreciate Thank it. you. <laughs> Can I have your hair in my next life, please? <laughs> oh my God, are you kidding me? You're no. <laughs> Over the coming weeks, her sickness grew worse as she was developing more shortness of breath, and none of the pills were helping fix this. And on the morning of December 20th, 2009, Brittany would awake and could hardly breathe at all. The story, according to her mom, is that she stepped out to get fresh air but quickly realizing that nothing was helping, she told her mom, I'm dying and I love you. And by the time she made it back inside and over to her bathroom, she would collapse around 8 a.m. Firefighters would be called to the home and attempted to resuscitate her before she was transported to Cedars Sinai Medical Center, where she would pass away at 10.04 a.m. after going into cardiac arrest. She was only 32 years old. In utter shock, Tributes would pour in from other media-battered celebrities like Jessica Simpson and Lindsay Lohan, in addition to Ashton Kutcher and Alicia Silverstone. 
Now immediately, the media, rather than expressing any sorrow or empathy for how they treated her, would go into speculation of substance usage or a cover-up by her mother and Simon. Reports had emerged that Britney was behaving erratically on movie sets, and her being recently fired from a movie set didn't paint her in the best light either. Many people felt that because it was uncommon for a seemingly healthy 32-year-old to suddenly die of cardiac arrest, with certain experts suggesting that aside from heart defects, the likely cause of her demise was due to illegal substance usage or an eating disorder. She was 115 pounds when she died, but was also short in stature. Now, it didn't help that Simon detested Britney receiving an autopsy. As to him, he didn't want everyone in their business. Didn't want an autopsy at first. No, I did There was this woman who had just lost her daughter. It was such a shock. This pristine body that was curvy in all the right places and the skin like silk. And I, how could I say in front of her mother, cut her up? Because I know you can't. She said, Mom, I'm dying. I love you. And Mom, I'm dying. I love you. She knew she was dying. <laughs> This is about an hour before, but... No, 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 baby, this was the you forgotten oh, time. Oh. Either way, as standard procedure, the autopsy would be performed the next day and would take about four to six weeks to complete. In the meantime, Simon and Sharon attempted to keep a low profile amidst the press and paparazzi being camped outside their front door. However, when he did open up, it was to only a few close reporters, in which he defended himself against the allegations, saying that he wasn't in control. He said, she found love, we found love. Britney didn't get to where Britney was with anyone controlling her. Britney was Britney. And he blamed the death on the media, saying that the nature of this town is exploitive. Britney would be alive today if she was a housewife in Edison, New Jersey, or a successful person in another business. And when the autopsy results came back, the manner of death was listed as accidental, and the cause of death was pneumonia, with secondary factors of severe iron deficiency anemia and multiple substance intoxication. The coroner found elevated levels of several over-the-counter and prescription medications in Brittany's system, with the most likely reason being to treat a cold or respiratory infection. The report observed that the possible adverse physiological effects of elevated levels of these medications cannot be discounted, especially in Britney's weakened state. But the general public weren't satisfied with that answer, and many people close to her sought to get a second opinion. As the clouds of suspicion continued to loom over Simon, more digging into his past uncovered several marriages and two children by two different women who he had reportedly threatened to take full custody of if their mothers told a soul after his marriage to Britney became public. Also, it didn't help that the energy surrounding Simon and Sharon in pictures and in interviews was somewhat odd. They came across more as grieving parents rather than mother-in-law and son-in-law. And when it came out that the two also shared a bed together, they claimed it was only after Britney's death and that they did so in bereavement as neither could sleep by themselves in that big old house after her demise. Over the next few months, Simon was under constant attacks from people who determined that he was the villain. And if he was trying to appear innocent, it definitely wasn't working. We have a, <laughs> we have, we we have a job to do. It's called the Brittany Murphy Foundation. Him and Sharon established the Brittany Murphy Foundation, a charitable fund for children's arts education, as well as supporting the USO and cancer research and they were trying to throw together a fundraising memorial event and encourage the invited guests, many of whom were mostly industry people, to make donations in excess of several thousands of dollars. You know, in memory of Britney. But after a record search revealed that the foundation's non-profit status had not been filed, the foundation was forced to refund donations, if any, that they had received. And they would say that they had decided to wait until the status was approved before going any further in order to truly honor Britney, and the foundation would go defunct. With nowhere else to turn, Simon started drinking more and medicating, staying locked away for weeks on end. And on May 23rd, 2010, just five months after Britney, he too would be found dead in his room. Like Britney, the coroner's report attributed his death to acute pneumonia and severe anemia which raised more than a few eyebrows. The Los Angeles County Department of Health would come and inspect the home for other possible factors and found a considerable amount of toxic mold in the home and initially considered it as a possible cause of the deaths. But this was dismissed by the LA Assistant Chief Coroner Ed Winter, 
who stated that there were no indicators that mold played a factor, and Sharon herself called the mold allegations absurd. Not buying any of it, Britney's father Angelo would appear out of nowhere and would apply to the Superior Court of California to gain possession of Britney's hair samples that were not used in the autopsy process for independent testing, which would reveal higher than normal levels of 10 heavy metals in his daughter's hair. And the lab he used suggested that such a result was most likely from third party poisoning. And he would appear on various TV shows using these results to claim that Sharon had in fact poisoned the couple. But Sharon would fire back claiming that this was nothing more than a money grab from a man who was never a real father to Britney, but simply used her celebrity status to extract money from her since the dawn of her career. Sharon would also change her stance on the mold, claiming that it may have actually been a contributed factor to her daughter and son-in-law's demise. Angelo would relaunch the Britney Murphy Foundation and pick right up where Simon left off. Unfortunately, many sources debunk the heavy metal in hair theory and claim that it likely came from the various hair dyes that Britney had used. Angelo's case would be dropped from the courts after he failed to attend two important hearings. The foundation itself would also go defunct by 2018, and her father would pass away in 2019 at 92 years of age. As for Sharon, she would be left nearly penniless after finding out that all of the quote-unquote investments that Simon had led her to believe in were as fake as the jewelry in her house. The real jewelry had been pawned to feed off other habits and replaced with decoys to make everything appear peachy and fine. Sharon was, however, able to sell Britney's clothes and walk away with just enough funds to live alone, quietly, in a small home in Southern California after selling the $10 million fortune that was Britney's house. But Britney's half-brother, Tony, would paint quite a different picture, claiming that Britney was deliberately killed and that Britney's estate lies in the hands of three people, Sharon, an editor of a major Hollywood newspaper, and also a diabetes doctor from Miami that she was seeing. Those were the names on the estate. As for Britney's demise, Tony says that the only other person that knows what really happened is the butler, who had quit and had confided in Angelo before he died. Huh. This of course leaves more questions than answers. There have been a few documentaries about Britney over the years, like the HBO special, which actually dives more into Simon's life than anyone else's, and the god-awful Lifetime biopic, which, if you watched Orange is the New Black and remember the character Badison, yeah, they got her to play Britney. And much like Lifetime's Aaliyah biopic, this one was a travesty. Britney's real-life story is still waiting to be uncovered and the rabbit hole gets deeper and deeper, and it's unclear if nearly 14 years later we'll ever get any true resolve, as Britney's legacy remains shrouded in mystery and dark reminders of what could have been. As far as having a New Year's resolution, I'd love to have a child next year. Thank you so much. She had plans to start a family and was said to have been working on her debut album, but the time ran out much too quick. Rest in peace to Brittany Murphy. You were a light and inspiration, even as the world attempted to drain the life out of you and your passion. But we the fans are going to continue to cherish your works. This is Justified by Jury. Y'all know how to hit that like. Y'all know how to hit that subscribe. If you want to, do so. And I'm going to catch y'all on the next one.